It's time for Pet Files Ask the Vet, underwritten by the Miller's Veterinary Practice, traditional small animal medicine and surgery, chiropractic, laser therapy, acupuncture, and Chinese herbal medicine, 518-789-3440, millersonvet.com. With us today, Dr. Carolyn Cannon, owner and chief vet at the Miller's Veterinary Practice, with her supporting staff. Hello, Dr. Cannon. Good morning. They are always my my good support when I get on the by <clears throat> excuse me am I busy at all talking to anyone they are there in the background do you know how um how reassuring that is to other people that that happens to the veterinarian <laughs> yeah it's a, it's universal it's, it's but it's totally cool because it's like it, it's like all right well it just it becomes something that just is <clears throat> dan Absolutely. dan and sharon Recently, it occurred to me that I really don't know anything about water safety for my dogs. How would you know if a dog was having trouble in the water? If their head goes under, can they hold their breath at all? If they took water into the lungs, can you do chest compressions for it like you would for a person? One of my dogs is a corgi and one is a hound mix. This is a great question and one that I don't think that we have talked about in all these years. I was just going to say, in all of these years. And I and I actually had a retriever who, we were in a spring, it was the first shark, and it was in New York State, uh, uh, you know, Upper Westchester County, and he jumped into a spring, and then it started looking like he was going to sink. And the friend I was with jumped in, and it became a joke that he had to save the shark. (laughs) That is a good joke. Well, if they don't know how to swim, dogs will go out sometimes over their head. Or if you have a dog who who has been swimming before, maybe go out after something and get hooked up a little bit on um, something under the water, try to touch down. This is what happens when they panic, is that they try to touch their hind feet to the floor. And if if it's too deep, they're going to go under. Uh, Dogs can hold their breath under the water if they're used to that. So... um, you know, dogs who dig for um, things, rocks usually underneath the water. My, I had a dog who did that, and she definitely knew how to hold her breath. She blew bubbles. She'd get exactly the rock that she wanted and pull it out and, uh, you know, hold, held her breath just fine. Uh, the problem is when you have a dog who panics. So it's, it is important when these dogs are young or if you've newly acquired a dog to really sort of have training sessions in shallow water where you've got a leash on your dog, they can go out over their head a little bit and understand that they need to swim in order to stay afloat. And uh, if they touch down, you know, that's what some, sometimes they'll do. Then sometimes the ground is there and sometimes it's not, and they've got to get their, their wits about them and keep going. Um, it is possible for a dog to drown in the water like that if they panic and they go under. Uh, I am familiar with a with a um, a situation where the dog was a youngish dog had been swimming many times before, and uh, grabbed a stick and panicked for some reason, and the back feet went under, and the dog went under the water upside down, and did drown. So um, that addresses part of it. Um, if you've got a dog like a quirgy or a, a hound mix, which I think is what you said Dan has. Those dogs aren't great swimmers to begin with, usually, and so you can buy them a flotation device. It's not a bad idea. And teach swimming in a shallow area where there's not a lot of water movement, like a pond, with a, with a leash on. <clears throat> um, some dogs need that flotation device. You know, a corgi may need that in order to keep them afloat. What, what are they? How, how do they dog paddle? How does a corgi dog paddle? Right. The well, funniest... some of them can swim. Some of them, right. I, I had a, a, quiet, a, a patient, bulldog patient, who could swim in the pool and did really well. But no, you know, there's no other bulldogs that swim that I'm aware of. Right. Um, so they can, and I tell you, it's really good exercise for them when they're older. But they need to be really supervised for you know, during the initial um, swims. And you need to be prepared, if you're a good swimmer, to go in and save save your dog if they don't have a flotation device on. Um, the other thing is trouble in the water is a big problem if you've got a rushing river. And these dogs are not um, 
discerning. If they're used to being in the river in the summer, they might go in the river when it's really high and, and rushing and get stuck and be floating downstream where, where they start to panic because they can't see you anymore. So we have to keep all of those things in mind. If you think that situation might arise, you keep your dog on leash. Um, and I'm just going to, again, interject here, especially for, I mean, not so much for Dan and Sharon, but for people who come up from the city, as I once did a long time ago. And uh, I, I, had, I had a swimming shark who would swim, he would cross the river and go, that, 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 that was not the first one I discussed, this was the third one. And he would just go, he didn't care. But he had a brother who like was a, also a retriever, but not the greatest swimmer. And we both almost drowned because he went in the river, a high river, not even rushing, but high after a rock, just because someone threw a rock in. It's like, yeah, tennis ball. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it was a really cold day in March and it was, you know, it was sort of warm, but the water was really cold. So there are a lot of things, you know, not, not to be a total buzzkill, but wherever you just see throwing a stick in the water for your dog, you know, stop there. Please just stop. Because as seen on TV and the actual, you know, understanding uh, can be quite different. Yes, even with a retriever, when yeah, you think uh, that they're supposed to be natural swimmers, right? And 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 there are that. That's why I told the first story. The natural swimmer, you know, was sinking, but then I, you know, we moved along and 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 got some. And I mean, they're all natural. They 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 they, they really are. That's that's what they do. But that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they can't get into difficulty. <laughs> unlike I they mean, they can get into difficulty too. And I should mention when they're panicky. If you've got a big dog and you're not a good swimmer, you could drown from yeah, a panicky dog. You're both you're both going down. Well, maybe that's actually, right. well, either that or the, the dog sometimes comes out. But I remember thinking about that with uh, the, then Diesel. Uh, okay. He'll be fine because I can boost him up, but I'm going to drown. Right, and it had right. nothing so you to do with. You have to be very careful because they do go after you with their front paws, you know, um, and but, they can scratch you and hurt you and and hold you under the water. But it was more this, and <clears throat> what I found interesting about that, and then we'll move on to the next question. But this was the side of a river that he could have climbed out of, but the water was so high he couldn't get purchase. Right. right. Yeah. All right, and again, who would who who would think of that? Right. So right. He, part he, of this question, I think, that I missed was, uh, uh, can you do sort of a CPR? You can do chest compressions and should if you have a dog who's got a, a chest full of water. Absolutely. If you've got a hill to lie them on to, you know, head downward, chest compressions to get the water out uh, is a great idea. All right. By the end of this uh, show, people will be certified in pet water safety. <laughs> And we will move on to Adam and Rebecca in Schenectady. Our usual vet is on vacation, and the techs are overwhelmed with work, so we are hoping you can advise us. It breaks my heart to say this, but our sweet Newfie seems to be at the end of his life. Most likely, he has liver cancer. He has fever, very high white blood cell count. All of his liver functions are bad, discolored urine, loss of appetite, and energy. What we want to know is what we can possibly do for him to make him more comfortable. And what would be the sign that he's in too much pain and we should take him in to be put to sleep? We love him so much and we want to do right by him. Well, first of all, I'm I'm so sorry that you're having to go through this. This is a really difficult time for for anyone when we bring up our pets and we live with them for so many years and to have to see them suffer toward the end of life is really difficult. Uh, And and they're difficult decisions to make. Um, Practical decisions and monetary decisions, et cetera, and, and it's all hard. Um, so first thing I guess I would say is that um, if your vet's on vacation and the techs are overwhelmed, then there must be another veterinarian there <clears throat> because techs can't be working without a uh, vet in, on the premises. So, um, you know, I would, I would throw this uh, maybe have a discussion with the other veterinarian uh, who has access to the medical records. So it's a little bit difficult for me um, not having access to what's going on and what tests were run and what does the blood work look like. Um, I can say that with with a fever, most dogs won't eat. And so if your dog's not eating, very lethargic, doesn't want to do the things that he usually does and has uh, a disease that he's not going to get better from, then that's the time that you need to consider life quality. But uh, can fever there, be, can, is there anything that can be done for dog fever or no? There is, but you have to be careful what you use 
with liver disease, especially a dog who might be icteric or jaundiced. Um, there definitely is, you know, uh, and, and you have to be careful what you give with a dog who's not eating well. All right. I'm going to, um, we are going to wish Adam and Rebecca the very best. Um, and, but, but they should definitely check with their, if, if, given this, they should definitely check with their practice. For pain, I would ask about gabapentin and tramadol because those are things that sometimes you can get away with giving that are pain relief. Uh, that are um, that are okay to give with a dog who's got a fever and won't bring the fever down, but will help them to um, to cope. Basically, uh, things that you can give when dogs aren't eating well. Um, but it is a you know it's a difficult um, difficult for me to give you more specific advice than that. You will have to really pay attention to life quality and um, and euthanize when it's when there's no hope for better life quality. Right, and this is, we had a shark who, you know, really loved. Uh, he, the the only thing he liked in life was uh, uh, this kind of tortellini that came in a soup from a store here, and he would be really happy with that. And then the day that he didn't want the tortellini was like the day that uh, we knew when that you the quality knew, of right, life when you was already just, knew he had something. Oh yeah, you he, know, oh, he already had something. Yeah. Right, but because by, by the time your dog's eating tortellini, you already know. Or should. There you go. Right. You want them to eat whatever you can get them to eat. Right. Yeah. yeah. But but as I said, that that's that's actually not on that's not on the usual feeding plan. All right. right. Shanika in Middletown. I have two sibling kitties about eight months old. They love to wrestle, but sometimes it gets a little intense, and one of them will get scratched up pretty bad. My question is, what can I use to disinfect the scratches at home that won't make them sick if they lick it? You know, most of the time you don't need to disinfect them if it's if it's a superficial scratch, but you could use a little bit of hydrogen peroxide on a cotton ball just to go to that specific area, and you only use it once because it can delay wound healing. And uh, once it dries, it shouldn't be anything that causes um, vomiting. You know, you have to give quite a bit of hydrogen peroxide to make a cat vomit. And usually it doesn't work. So a little bit on the surface of the skin um, to disinfect from uh, potential bacteria from the other kitten's toenails um, is, is fine to use just once. Okay. So I, I, I forgot that about hydrogen peroxide delaying healing. Yeah. And if you, but if you put, you know, if you go putting bacitracin or neosporin on there, they're going to lick it right off and then they're going to throw up. So and what if you that. spray? What if you have a... a, a... One of my favorite things in the world is a neosporin spray. It comes in a little thing. Well, the thing about cats is that they're 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 pretty fastidious. Yeah. Yeah. So even with the peroxide, you want to get just on top of the the area because it's going to draw their attention to lick it and, um, you know, play with them for a a little bit so that they're not licking it off. And, um, yeah. Stupid stupid question. How about what if you did nothing? Probably things would be fine. With a, with a full thickness scratch or a bite, then you may end up with an abscess. But with a superficial scratch, um, usually they'll heal fine. All right. And with a full uh, the, the full clump? Then you can use peroxide. Yeah. Okay. All right. Alcohol would be would be Pink. sting terribly. Oh, God. Yeah, you try and hold that cat while it's jumping out of its... <laughs> oh. oh. All right. Hassan and Danbury. How would you know if a dog had bed bugs? I would guess bed bugs can bite dogs just like they can bite people, but uh, I don't think they live on dogs. So they, they, you know, just like cockroaches, they run and hide in the, uh, in the daylight. And so they can um, bite and cause itch. So if you have a really itchy dog, you're looking around, you can see bed bugs, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't think I've ever seen one, but I've seen pictures. They're big enough that you can see them, and uh, you could probably use a flea comb to get them off. Uh, if you do find them, and then if your dog is super itchy because they may be having a response to the bed bug bites, then you can call your veterinarian and get something for the itch. Um, but while you're taking care of the bed bugs, clearly, yeah. So yeah, and that's the that's the issue is they live on the furniture, they live in the in the cracks, and uh, so that I'm not an expert at treating bed bugs. And you wouldn't use any, you wouldn't get creative and use any flea or anything stuff on it for bed bugs, would you? I think that's probably overkill. Yeah. Um, no pun intended. 
Yes, you're not going to have uh, an infestation on a dog because they're not going to live on the dog. They'll bite, but then they go into hiding during the during the daylight hours. Right. So, um, and they prefer to bite people, is my understanding. Good. I think people taste better. All right, Marcy in Bro- to a bed bug. Marcy in Brooklyn. I like to give Shiloh my five year old rotting mix cooked veggie snacks. My pet insurance just published a blog post with a list of foods that are safe and unsafe for dogs. It says you shouldn't let them eat wild mushrooms in case they're poisonous, which makes sense. But it goes on to say you shouldn't let them eat store-bought mushrooms for the same reason. Uh, expletive deleted. If store-bought mushrooms sometimes have poisonous ones in there, we're all in trouble, right? Is there any reason that makes actual sense not to let Shiloh eat store-bought mushrooms? There is no reason that I know of that a dog cannot eat mushrooms that you buy in the store. If they're edible for people, they're edible for dogs. I wouldn't give them, you can't buy psilocybin mushrooms in the store. And of course, you would never do that to your pet. But all the mushrooms that you could buy at Stop and Shop should be fine to give your dog. So you can give your dog portobello mushrooms? Mm-hmm. How, and how much mushroom can you? Well, everything in moderation. I know, we, we, right? we always so, say this, but I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what's, you know, what qualifies as moderation? You know, like well, a, like I wouldn't, a, for instance, give mushrooms every day, all day long, just as I wouldn't give cooked carrots every day, all day long. So if you're talking about cooked veggie snacks, you want to mix it up because of the nutrients that are in the various vegetables. So, you know, um, and use vegetables. I mean, I give my dogs um, roasted sweet potatoes. They just love them, and we use that for a snack. Um, but I don't do it every day. Uh, one of them eats broccoli. I give a little broccoli here and there. Um, you, the, the things that you want to stay away from that people can eat is uh, onions, garlic, and grapes and raisins. Those are the big ones. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense because raisins. Anything raisin, with xylitol. Raisin, right. Oh, xylitol. Yeah. <laughs> Which isn't going to be right. Which no, but going to be in the in the veggie mix. No, but that that that's still something you have to be aware of because you know it's because kids have stuff with xylitol all the time. Right. Gum and, um, but just it's easy enough because onions and garlic are in the allium family and grapes and raisins. We know about that, so they they, they they're related. So you don't. You know, that, 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 that's, that, that's not hard. It's not hard to remember is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. But there isn't any uh, problem with store-bought mushrooms that, that I'm aware of. Never had a problem. Well, yeah, also... Now, the mushrooms that they eat out of the yard, of course... Those, that's something different. ...is a real problem That's a nightmare, here. right. We have so many. And, and, and while it's fascinating if you are in the gardening business and you want to know what kind of soil you have or what kind of grass you have growing there, having had a dog, having... <laughs> the late lamented <clears throat> Quidditch Goodman, who you know never had anything right with him, uh, was you just never knew which mushrooms were going to knock him uh, into a mess. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, we've got time for at least one more question. Heather and Gleason in Wingdale on the itch train. We went camping last week in Massachusetts, and ever since then, our dog's been super itchy, especially her flanks and butt. No evidence of anything that we can see like ticks or bumps or bites. Any ideas? The things that come to mind would be would be picking up fleas from other dogs at the at the camping area. So use a flea comb and and um, you know get through all of that fur, especially right around the the bump the excuse me the bum or the back end. Um, the base of the tail there is where the fleas like to collect. Uh, they bite a lot and cause itch. Um, possibly tick bites, but I would have expected you to find some ticks. Look really carefully. Make sure that the hair, push the hair in the wrong direction so you can see down to the skin. Um, Maybe also some dermatitis from being in the water a lot. So that's a possibility. So the dogs who spend, you know, if if you're by the water and you're in the water and the dog's in the water and really not drying out well because we've had so much humidity, then you can have a a dermatitis that happens underneath of the coat that you don't see very well. So you would check for redness, especially around those itchy areas. Um, Other than that, I'm not sure uh, I can think of anything specifically from camping. Maybe it's an anal gland problem, but that might not be specifically from camping. Right. 
Um, and I'm going to just skip to the next question, Mike and Cornwall Bridge, because it's, it's so similar. My golden doodle pup Bailey has started to smell funky. To be fair, I don't really notice it unless I pet him. But if I give him a scratch or a belly rub, my hand comes away smelling like old Swiss cheese. Like I said, funky. <laughs> he loves to swim in the river, and my girlfriend thinks that might be something to do with it. He's five. And that's Mike and Cornwall Bridge. Yeah, so that's another... Right. Another example here of being wet all the time. So I love that dogs swim. It's such good exercise for them. But if you live near a lake or a pond or a brook where they can have access all the time, you need to actively make sure that they get dry for much of the day. Otherwise, the skin becomes like ours did when we were kids in the bathtub for too long. And it's, it's, uh, it's susceptible to bacterial infection. The other thing that might be happening here is that uh, you know, my dogs smell bad after they've been in the river many times, and, and part of it is from the collar or from the, um, the harness staying wet. But you can have uh, some dogs, especially retrievers, who overproduce um, sebum. So there's glands in the skin. Dogs in the water all the time, those glands get hyped up, produce a lot of oils. The oil uh, becomes rancid and has a terrible odor. So severia is a possibility as well in this case. And and how does one uh yeah how, how does one treat that? Well, when the dog well, you know, to to help diagnose it when the right. dog is um is dry and uh completely dry, then you're still going to feel that the oil in the coat. So, and severia usually is itchy, there's hair loss, there's redness, all of that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you'll get that rancid smell, I think, from the skin because the skin is too wet for too long. Right. Sometimes it just smells like a stinky old pond. And and if you live next door to a swamp, <clears throat> that can be really fun. So really the answer is to keep them dry. And if you're keeping them dry for a few days and they're still having troubles, you know, you keep them dry, give a bath and keep them dry. And then uh, if it comes back, then you need to call the vet. Yep. And I think that that's that, that that's probably the common denominator for any of these questions because basically it's it's all you can do. I, this this has been the water edition, I believe, of uh, Pet Files Ask the Vet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Good and, time of year for that. Yeah, absolutely perfect. And because we are out of time, uh, this has been Pet Files Ask the Vet, underwritten by the Millers and Veterinary Practice, five one eight seven eight nine three four four zero Millers and Vet dot com. Who let the dogs out? Who? Who, 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 who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who?